So again, today we have a very blunt gospel from the Lord, uh, speaking about the importance of our daily activity. This is this is a real kind of an opus day spirituality as well, the sanctification of the of the day, sanctification of the ordinary things uh, that we each one of us, lay and religious, see that every action can be turned into a prayer. Everything from peeling potatoes to building a crib to putting up a Christmas tree to sanding floors to cleaning a chapel, all of this can be sanctified. Everything that we do can be sanctified, turned into a prayer, turned into, therefore, to something useful. Everything, everything, everything. And the Lord expects this of us. He expects us to transform everything into love. Some, as we mentioned uh, two days ago, Sunday, whenever, whatever, whatever day it was. Uh, some have a, a greater capacity, a greater ability to love than others. Some just are just really naturally huge hearts and just love everyone around them. Some are a little more cagey, uh, but all of us are expected to love. To some degree, all of us are expected to love, and we're expected to. This, we, we must do this. Why? Because at the end of the day, if we want to enter heaven, a kingdom of love, to be with God forever, who is love, then I must know how to love. So this is, this is like a prerequisite for entering into heaven that I, that I know how to love, that I am love, that I become love, that I love in this uh, self-sacrificial manner. So this is, this is serious, and that's why the Lord is really clear like this, this about you know, various executions and things at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the gospel, uh, because this is, this, is, this is a matter of life and death. Like this is, this is, we have to get this right. This is a matter of life and death. It doesn't get more serious. Okay, so and that's also, uh, we probably we explained this the last time, the uh, parable of, of the, the talents. Uh, but as for this servant, give his one pound to the man who has ten. And they say, well, why? He already has ten. And then the Lord gives this unusual answer. I tell you to everyone who has will be given more, but from the man who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So those who have lots will be given more. Those who have very little, even the little they have will be taken away. Obviously, the Lord here isn't talking about uh, blessings or he isn't talking about uh, the amount of grace that he wants to give someone or he isn't talking about like poverty. So those who are poor will become poor. Those who are rich will become richer because that kind of thing just simply doesn't, doesn't really matter to him. But those who have a great ability to love, because they love and they receive love in return, they love even more. Those who are mean in their love or don't love, their life gets more and more and more miserable. So even the little love they had, since the, it's not shared, it's not given to anyone, they're not loved in return, their life becomes more and more miserable. Uh, but this is nothing to do with money, obviously. As I say, the Lord doesn't really care about money. Uh, he wants us, to, obviously, to help those who are poor in that, but money is not what makes us happy. Uh, eternal life is. So that's his goal here. But I was thinking this morning... Um, when I woke up, this, this first reading uh, from the book of the Apocalypse, which is read so beautifully by Liam um, in his wonderful Donegal accent, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a reading that's spectacular. If you were a movie maker, I'd, I simply have no idea how you would do this, right? Trying to put into, uh, into film what this looks like. I mean, everything is so... And, and this is the, 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 the whole problem with, with, with the book of the Apocalypse, trying to describe heaven. Everything is so, it seems exaggerated, and yet it's not half enough. <laughs> but just how on earth do you describe heaven? You know, there was a rainbow encircling the throne, and this looked like an emerald, I suppose. Uh, around the throne, there, was, there were 24 thrones. And then I saw 24 elders sitting, dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning were coming from the throne. And the sound of peals of thunder. I mean, it actually sounds... It sounds, it sounds actually so dramatic, it sounds scary. You see these thrones, these big elders, and, and lightning, and thunder. Like, jeepers, is this a good place or a bad place? I'm not quite sure yet. I mean, this is good, I think, isn't it? But it's, everything is just so dramatic, right? It's huge. Everything is just, okay? Flashes of lightning come, coming from the throne, peals of thunder. And in front of the 12 thrones, there were seven lamps burning in the, for the seven spirits of God. Um, yeah, the person sitting on the throne looks like a diamond and a ruby. Such a man describing this, my goodness. Right. <laughs> Those are, you know, it's, 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 it's all so kind of huge, right? It's all just so enormous. So much so that when, this canon of, when the canon of scripture was being put together, 
deciding which book belonged to scripture and which didn't. Um, this one was kind of had a wee question mark after it for a while. Because I thought, well, is this, because it's very, very different. I mean, the reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Hello, Corinthians. Stop doing bad things. That's fairly straightforward, okay? But like, but this, this kind of thing, this is genie. This is so different to everything else in Scripture. Says, Should this be there? So they, they were kind of, they questioned it for a while, prayed, discerned, and of course the Holy Spirit, in the end, uh, inspired that, yes, indeed, it is divinely inspired. Why? Because we're trying to understand heavenly realities. No words will be enough, and everything is going to sound exaggerated. Everything. That's why even in the Catechism, like there's very little on heaven, because it's just so beyond us. And so then in the face of this, enormous, unfathomable, indescribable mystery. What do you say? <laughs> and what do you do? And how do you react? And as I was thinking of this this morning, I thought, okay, this is, this is, this is beyond me right now. I think I have to simplify things before my head bursts. And I just thought, okay, before all of this, what am I called to do? I'm called to love God. That's it. That's it. The greatest commandment given by the Lord himself, you know, summarizing the Torah. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That's it. All the rest is going to fall into place. What heaven is like, I'll see it when I get there. I'll see it when I get there. In the meantime, I have to love God and not just believe he exists, not just kind of tick the box with a bit of prayer or a bit of online mass or whatever we do, but to actually love the Lord, to actually love Jesus, love him. And this is something that I think especially for us lads, we find a little more difficult uh, to actually say it like, I love Jesus. It just, it, it sounds a bit, it sounds a bit Protestant, actually. Um, they, they're a lot seem a lot more f free in, in saying that for some whatever reason. Um, the fair play to them. We're just a bit awkward around it. I don't know. Uh, we just, it, it's, not, it's not Irish. Uh, probably not Catholic anyway. We just, we just find it difficult. And yet it should be the most natural thing of all to say that we love the Lord, that we love Jesus. You know, through him all things are created. He who has emptied himself for love of us. It should be the most natural thing in the world to respond to love with love. This wee book, uh, which was up in my bookshelf, right? That's, it's actually moth-eaten. That's why it's got no spine. There doesn't, you can't see what it says. It's pretty old, but it's class. Uh, I remember reading this book when I was in seminary. I used to read it on the train on the way into to university. You can see all my underlining. It's a squiggly because we were on, I was on a train. Uh, but I, I read most of this going in and out of, of, of seminary, and I loved it. It's, it's a fantastic book. Oh, sorry. It's St. Francis de Sales, an introduction to the... St. Francis de Sales, an introduction to the devout life, or Philothea, as it's often called. Um, it's just... Because he's so practical. Like He's just got really, really practical spirituality, which is just fantastic. And I quote, Do not children, as they hearken to their mother and lisping imitate her, gradually learn to speak her language. And so if we remain close to the Saviour, meditating on him and giving heed to his words, his actions and his affections, we shall gradually, by the help of his grace, learn to speak, to act and to will like him. So simple. When we spend time with the Lord, we become like him. We learn to speak, to act and to will as he does. And he is love. So the more time we spend with him, the more we learn to love. The more we love, the more love we receive in return. And then the more we're able to love. The more we love, the more love we receive in return. It just becomes this, this cycle of, of, of love, which is exactly what the inner life of the Trinity is, this cycle of love between the, all three members of the Trinity. So the more I learn to love, the more I become like God. So becoming like God doesn't mean I can shoot lightning bolts or tell the future or know what the lottery numbers are and useless things like that. But I know how to love. 
That's what makes me like God. I know how to be merciful. That's what makes me like God. And then if I can be trusted with the little love that I'm capable of here, the little mercy that I'm capable of here, according to our gospel, we'll receive 10 cities, which obviously doesn't mean up in heaven we'll be governors or something, Gavna. But what it, <laughs> what it means is that the little power I get here, I get far more up in heaven. So I, become, I, 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 can, I can be trusted to share in God's divine nature. Now, what exactly that looks like, we don't really know. But the most important thing is love, that I will be able to love with, with, ever, with an ever more divine heart. That's just astounding. And it starts here. It starts now. It starts today with my choices, with the jobs that I do and how much love I do them with. One last quotation from St. Francis de Sales. Sugar sweetens unripe fruit and neutralizes the acidity of those that are already ripe. So, true devotion is a spiritual sugar which takes away the bitterness of mortification and the danger of gratification. It counteracts the poor man's discontent and the rich man's self-satisfaction. The loneliness of him that is oppressed and the vain glory of the successful. So this is all... Uh, true devotion, okay? It takes away the sadness of him that is alone and the dissipation of him that is in society. It is as fire in winter and dew in summer. It knows how to abound and how to suffer need. It draws some good alike from honor and contempt. It accepts both joy and suffering with an even spirit. And it fills us with a marvelous sweetness. This is all true devotion, which we can, another word for true devotion is, is, is love, that we love the Lord. So we ask the good Lord to renew our love today. As we remember St. Joseph, his simple action of love, every time the Lord inspired him, every time, he was spoken to by an angel in a dream. When he was asked to do something by God, he up and does. So we ask the good Lord to inspire our actions today, one day at a time, that we might transform today into one occasion after the next where we can love. Amen.